Welcome to the second in a series of water availability listing sessions. This is co-hosted by the U.S. Geological Survey and NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System. That's NIDAS. You'll probably hear us say that multiple times. Um, these listening sessions seek input on priorities and needs related to predicting water availability changes under drought conditions at both national and regional scales. This input will be used to guide the uh, USGS drought program planning and orientation and will additionally be making the findings available to support complementary activities in drought and water availability by other agencies. So um, I want to, uh, again, thank everybody for taking this opportunity to provide this input on what you need and in helping us prioritize the development of, of science for uh, your drought applications. Um, again, uh, we appreciate in advance bearing with us through any potential hiccups that may occur. Uh, we're using several at least new features to us uh, of teams of Microsoft Teams to organize breakout groups today and provide, uh, um, you know, hopefully provide interaction and presentations in a, an effective and fun way. So uh, again, thanks to the whole a whole team of folks we'll we'll probably get to even later in the, the day the, the team of folks that help make this happen. So my name is Brian Clark. I'm the acting USGS drought program coordinator or program manager actually. For this introductory session, I will be acting as your co-moderator. And I'm Marina Skumanich. I'm a program specialist at NIDIS and coordinator of the National Coordinated Soil Moisture Monitoring Network. So a special thanks to everyone again for joining the session today. We're going to start off with a quick introduction to NIDIS and the USGS, and then we'll share a series of three presentations that will provide context for our subsequent discussions. These are going to be on groundwater prediction, challenges of understanding hydrologic drought, and an example application of how information on groundwater, groundwater availability is used in drought management. Throughout this part of the program, we will also be periodically providing opportunities for interactive engagement via menti polling to get to know you and some of your groundwater information needs. And after the presentations, we will then split up into small breakout groups to seek your input on national and regional scale priorities for, for your drought applications. So then after that, the, after the uh, breakout sessions, we'll reconvene and have a preliminary discussion of the input and feedback received. So our primary goal today is listening to and documenting your needs and priorities. And, and again, thank you for your participation. So starting with who we are and why we're here, uh, just real briefly, we have a few summary statements on this slide for both USGS and NIDIS. So the USGS mission involves monitoring, analyzing, and predicting complex human and natural earth system interactions, and then delivering that in an actual, uh, delivering actionable intelligent at scales and timeframes relevant to uh, decision making. Thus, the reason we're here to talk about drought prediction. Uh, NIDIS mission is to work in collaboration with partners at all levels to help the nation prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. So. We're partnering on this series of listening sessions to support a, a comprehensive interagency approach for drought research and prediction so that tools may be developed to help states, tribes, local communities all plan for and mitigate the impacts of drought. Um, today, your moderators and facilitators and the note takers will all represent uh, USGS or NIDIS, and we look forward to the discussions and getting to know you and your perspective. Okay, to give a sense of the diversity of our attendees today, here are the people of where people registered from across the U.S. You can see a large contingent are from the western U.S. But we also have a good representation from the Plain States and from the Southeast and Northeast. And notably, we also had individuals register from a number of tribal nations. Internationally, we also had registrants from various locations, including Canada, Brazil, Chile, Germany, Greece, Gabon, Ethiopia and China. So we're excited to get those diverse perspectives and input from our for our conversation today. So to add to this picture, we can now see the Menti poll that you all just recently filled out, giving us a sense of where folks are coming from. And I got it. I got to look close because my eyes aren't so good. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've got great representation from the Northeast and Southeast, uh, and then otherwise um, really scattered across the, the region. 
I'm not, can anyone see international, Brian? I'm sorry, territories. We've got one person from the territory and yeah. some reasons not on the list, which we invite you to add that to the uh, chat. So yep. we'll be recording that chat and being able to reflect back the, the wide diversity of participants. So I think it's time for us to move on to our next polling opportunity. Okay, perfect. Oh, let me move some stuff around here. Working on multiple screens sometimes. So <clears throat> as, uh, as Marina said, as a group, we'd like to get your input on our collective familiarity with groundwater availability and prediction products. Uh, so if you haven't already, you can open Minimeter again. Uh, you might just want to leave that, that one open and it'll progress through the day here, but you can go to that mini.com and use the code listed. Again, you can capture it with the QR code on your phone. And for this one, let us know which category best describes your interaction with groundwater availability and prediction products. So you should have the option to choose multiple categories if they apply. And we also include an option for items not on the list. So if that, if that, that applies to you, please uh, enter a response in the chat uh, to let us know more. So we'll, we'll, we can leave that up there for just a second, and then we can uh, switch to those results in just a moment and kind of see how things are coming in or whenever you're ready actually Eric because I think the link is would be on the uh, results tab as well. See what kind of race develops here. Several several uh, so the lead out in the lead looks like not currently using groundwater prediction products. Oh, uh oh. It flipped to the slide. There we go. But we have a, a oh, it's, there it is. OK, so we have the, the group that regularly uses groundwater prediction projects, products are uh, steadily gaining there. Nice. What are we up to? About 53, 54 respondents so far. We'll give it just a few more seconds in case anyone else is pondering the question a bit. So pretty diverse group as far as groundwater prediction products go. What do you think, Marina? Yeah, yeah. It looks like we've got everyone from rarely used, don't currently use to generate information used to create the product so that will mean we're going to have a nice healthy discussion across uh, across experiences and, and sectors absolutely okay it's leveled out a little bit so how about uh, so thank you for that input and we'll move on to a summary of today's agenda Okay, so we're going to move out of introductions now and into our set of three presentations on groundwater prediction and hydrologic drought, challenges of understanding hydrologic drought, and an example application of how information on groundwater information is used in drought management. Between presentations, as I mentioned before, we will, we will be including some additional polling questions. And then after the presentations, we will briefly introduce the upcoming breakout and then take a short break before moving into those breakout discussions. After the breakouts, we'll again have a short break and then return to the plenary for the report out and wrap up and share some next steps. All right, so we are now ready for our first presentation by Todd Caldwell with the USGS Nevada Water Sciences Center. Todd will, Todd will be speaking on groundwater drought, onset recovery and propagation. Todd is a groundwater hydrologist that specializes in unsaturated zone processes and remotely sensed soil products. He is a team member of the USGS Drought Program and works with NIDIS on the development of the National Coordinated Soil Moisture Monitoring Network. We're working on the National Drought Program for the USGS Water Mission Area. And today I'd like to present some background on groundwater drought and drought propagation through the hydrological cycle. Drought metrics, like the standardized precipitation index for rainfall and the Palmer Drought Severity Index for soil moisture, are used to characterize drought severity as the product of its duration and magnitude. These indicators reflect physical drought impacts in various sectors that cannot easily be weighted or aggregated through some sort of direct measure. As such, indices are critical for drought mitigation and operational water management. 
More holistically, the rate of drought onset and recovery and its propagation through the hydrologic cycle can improve our ability to predict the response of groundwater and stream flow to these climate anomalies. Hydrological drought differs in dynamics from meteorological drought. The large size of most groundwater systems bus buffers the impact of meteorological drought, which is often delayed and attenuated with timescales ranging from months to years. Onset is the period where a given anomaly or index drops continually below a specified threshold indicating the start of drought. Recovery is the period of positive anomaly increase terminating the drought. Each hydrological system may have a different onset and recovery period, as well as different rates of change as drought and onset and recovery propagates through the whole system. The rate and lag of onset and recovery and the propagation for precipitation to groundwater within a given basin can provide information on watershed resiliency and vulnerability. A last note on this figure, while drought events are by definition extreme events, drought occurrence across the entire, entire hydrological system is a relatively common feature noted by that red line on the bottom. Some components are almost always in drought regardless of the others. Monitoring wells are perhaps the most direct evidence of groundwater drought. However, the time series of levels can be short, sporadic, and incomplete in national groundwater databases such as the National Water Information System and the National Groundwater Monitoring Network. Wells provide a keyhole into the aquifer, but not necessarily a direct observation of aquifer storage or response to drought. Observation wells are not always in shallow and confined aquifers directly recharged by precipitation. Wells are more often in areas of significant groundwater withdrawal for irrigation, and drought may likely increase such withdrawals. Models, on the other hand, estimate aquifer storage and are generally constrained by precipitation and stream flow, but many other uncertainties in these models are often lumped into groundwater storage. Remote sensing, primarily through NASA's GRACE satellite, provides a direct measure of total water storage, but requires models to disaggregate these gravity anomalies into changes in groundwater storage, and the spatial resolution is very coarse. Finally, data assimilation blends models and observations from satellite and in situ data to statistically push the models towards observations and reduce model uncertainty and bias. The top right figure shows the correlation between shallow groundwater storage from the GRACE data assimilation product and over 4,000 observation wells with more than 10 years of data. Darker symbols show wells with higher correlation to GRACE, indicating a greater coupling to atmospheric conditions. Note the scatter with the high correlation for a well in Alabama. Uh, the blue crosses on the map indicate no significant correlation, such as shown in the lower scatter plot of Last Chance Well in Nevada. Here, groundwater mining is, mining is lowering independent lowering levels independent of drought. While GRACE does measure groundwater withdrawal, Data assimilation cannot fully adjust these models for such human-induced changes to the water balance. Monthly maps of terrestrial water storage change are constructed from NASA's Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment and the GRACE follow-on satellites, which detect small changes in the Earth's gravity field caused by the redistribution of water on and beneath the land surface. The paired satellites travel about 140 miles apart at an altitude of 300 miles and record small changes in the distance separating them as they encounter variations in the Earth's gravity field. The vertical extent is measured in centimeters of equivalent water thickness, which is mostly related to near surface water storage in vegetation, soils, groundwater, and reservoirs. The terrestrial water storage is generally decomposed by depth into soil moisture and groundwater using land surface models. The spatial resolution is one degree or about 400 kilometers, which is too coarse for local or even regional applications. At larger scales, GRACE provides a direct measure of storage anomaly and precipitation needed for recovery. For example, the GRACE data measured a departure of nearly 90 million acre feet during the 2011 drought of record in Texas. Nearly 150 millimeters of precipitation would be needed to recover from the drought, which didn't occur until 2015. Groundwater data at the appropriate scale remains a big challenge in monitoring drought in the groundwater systems. As drought propagates through the hydrological cycle, there's a significant lag in the onset and recovery of the groundwater system. Furthermore, humans compound drought signals by changing levels and pumping. Ultimately, we want to be able to predict how much rainfall is needed for drought recovery and how quickly we can expect this recovery and which watersheds are most vulnerable. Furthermore, we're interested in how hydrological drought affects the interactions between surface and groundwaters, since most groundwater is recharging surface waters. And what data can we 
developed to improve prediction of groundwater drought. We need more wells, better spatial representation in models and satellite data, or a better way to implement these models using data assimilation. And with that, I hope we have a good discussion this afternoon. Thanks for your time and attention. Thanks very much, Todd. That was a really great overview of groundwater onset and propagation and some of the tools and their limitations, which is exactly, as you said, what we want to be speaking to today. So if you ha have any questions for Todd, please do post them in the chat and he will respond then. And to follow Todd's talk, we have another polling opportunity for you to provide some feedback on the times when you have had to make a decision in the absence of groundwater information or predictions. Yeah, definitely. So once again, if you'd like to take part in this, please return to that Mentimeter website, provide your input regarding how often a uh, lack of information on groundwater availability and groundwater prediction during a drought has, may have cost you or your customers or negatively impacted research uh, resource management decisions. Sorry. Um, so responses may include frequently, occasionally, rarely, never, not applicable, things like that. As individuals respond, we'll be able to see those responses coming up in real time. So we'll give this just a minute or two. Let some folks dial in and see uh, how this lays out. And I'm going to count on you, Brian, since my eyes just can't resolve that. That's small. <laughs> I do have to move it to another screen. So I know I'm looking off to the side now. So I expanded a little bit to see. Um, a lot are not applicable right now. So as far as maybe being involved directly in decision making processes related to uh, to profits or research management. And the, the, the next largest is actually the frequently, you know, frequently um, groundwater predictions are critical. We're at about 51, 52 entries so far. I think we got almost 60 a minute ago. So we'll let this ride out for just a moment. But yeah, the bulk. The bulk is, is kind of in the not applicable range right now. Several occasional, so a couple rarely. And there are five that are not something not on this list. So if you want, please do add your not on this list to the chat and we'll we'll be recording that to carry forward. Yep. In people's experiences. Perfect. So we're at about that that 60 mark. I think it's leveling off a little bit. So thank you again for adding your input. We and and hope this is an interesting way to get to know the group. And now we can move on to the next speaker, if you would mind, right? Okay, great. Well, next up is Edward Swain. He's the executive director of the Biometo, no Biometo, Biometa. He's going to correct me. Water Management District in Arkansas, who will be presenting on Arkansas water data and project implementation. Edward has served as the executive director of the Biometa Water Management District since April 2019. And prior to that, he served as chief of the Water Management Division of the Arkansas Natural Resources Commission from 2010 to 2019, as general counsel to the commission from 20. 2003 to 2010, and then Associate General Counsel from 1995 to 2001. So quite a long history with, with the group. So here's Edward. I'm Edward Swain, Edward. Executive Director of the Biomeda Water Management District in East Central Arkansas. If you recognize the crop in this picture, you know that I'm about to talk about water. This is rice, and Arkansas grows half of the rice produced in the United States. It takes about three feet of water to raise a rice crop. Arkansas is not all the same. In the north and west, we have mountains. In the southern part of the state, we have trees. And in east Arkansas, where it's flat, that's where we grow our row crops and we irrigate. Our water data is gathered by a team of private water users, local, state, and federal agencies, then analyzed to support good decisions. 
Crops use 80% of our water, thermoelectric power 11%, and public drinking water 3.5%. On this chart, we're ranked third in agricultural land in the nation, so it's no surprise irrigation is our number one use. Beginning with USGS's first well measurements in about 1927, Arkansas has probably built the best set of water information in any southeastern state. Our four big crops are rice, soybeans, corn, and cotton. Rice has been grown here commercially since the early 1900s. Rice takes on average three feet of water to grow. Many farmers are growing on less water, and that's the type of conservation that we'll need for long-term water sustainability. The USGS rankings in its 2015 water use report have Arkansas in the top five of total withdrawals and number two behind California in groundwater withdrawals nationally. 92.5 million acre feet of water runs across Arkansas in an average year, but we only satisfy 16% of our demand from the surface. The remaining 84% is from the ground. Our alluvial aquifer just below our feet is our most prolific source, supplying 96% of that groundwater. Ground and surface water withdrawals are reported annually. Most are not metered, but are estimates based on tables developed by state and federal agencies. Refining the numbers further is always a work in progress, but we know that groundwater storage has been going down for over 100 years. What storage remains? and what our current and projected withdrawals will be. We have a huge demand and supply gap. Brian Clark, one of our hosts, made this illustration. It shows the MIRAS model in action for East Arkansas and some of the surrounding states that share the alluvial aquifer around the Mississippi River. The lesson from this illustration is that if we don't change our water use patterns, we will run out of groundwater. So here's how we're responding to what we know about groundwater and water use. We're building a project to clean out bios and ditches to reduce flood damage, add to and enhance wildlife habitat, especially for ducks, and deliver enough surface water to farms to reduce groundwater use to sustainable levels. And this is our pumping station at Scott, Arkansas on the Arkansas River. Our project and its companion to the east will take river water, Arkansas River water for Biomeda and White River water for Grand Prairie and distribute it to farms. The little purple area to the left is the Plum Bio Irrigation Project that has operated for 30 years, taking Arkansas River water and distributing it to about 14,000 acres. It's a huge success. Our project will work by taking water out of the Arkansas River, pumping it into canals and bios, and moving it to farms with pipelines. When we get to the lower end of the system, we have a huge wildlife management area that has standing water on it too far into the spring. So we have a pump station at the bottom end that will push some of that excess water back into the Arkansas River. In a few years, when we begin to deliver water, will depend on data for day-to-day -day operations from stream gauging to metering of demand and then also measurements of groundwater response to make sure that we're having a positive effect on groundwater. If we pay attention to the data, we can adapt and continue to produce the commodities that are the base of our state's economy. If we ignore it or look for anecdotal confirmation of bad habits, then we're in trouble. Our first successful irrigation project, the Plum Bio Project, took data on water availability, groundwater shortages, and good old fashioned elevations from topo maps to determine that water could be taken from the river, pushed over a weir, and moved into a system that could water 14,000 acres. The farm in this picture gets its water from the Plum Bio Irrigation Project, and it will never run out of water. All right, well, thank you very much, Edward, for that interesting review of the Arkansas Water Project. 
And as before, if you have any questions for Edward, please post them in the chat. Yeah, definitely appreciate Ed uh, joining us there for that. And, and great to see there's still some visualizations that are in use. That was from uh, a, a previous life of mine, actually, as some early work in uh, some of the alluvial groundwater modeling there across several states. So thanks again. So at this point, uh, we can go back to another, another Mentimeter question. So we may all wonder what type of applications are of interest to attendees today. So we'll again uh, return to Menti and see what application areas may be represented. And these range from water resources and agriculture to ecosystems and geophysical research. So there's several different kind of categories uh, that, that might be applicable. You probably know the drill at this point, so we'll take a couple of minutes uh, to, to hit the Mentimeter question for this opportunity, and then we can flip over and take a look at those, uh, uh, those results as they're coming in. Here they go. And again, I think uh, the, the link and the, the code have been posted in chat a couple of times, but maybe we can even get that again. So interest in, of course, water resource management. Drought monitoring is a, is a big one there. Good to hear as I'm working with that drought program right now. Those are kind of our two leaders at the moment. Climatological or geophysical runs a pretty close third and maybe ag or forestry would be behind that. It's good stuff. Oh, we've already got 50 plus respondents in there. It's holding pretty steady, I think, between drought monitoring and resource management, and then the climate, climatological or geophysical. We are top three. We hit 60 pretty quick on that round. Level off there. Okay. You can probably okay. call that, yeah. but I can continue. If if anyone is still entering anything, by all means, um, you know, keep going. But yep, thanks again. And now we can move on to our final talk, right, Maureen? Right. I was going to say for those of you who weren't in the top three for your your application area, don't worry. We still want to hear about your needs, and so that's again going to be part of the breakout sessions. So yes, we're ready for our final presentation from Tyler Hatch, who's a supervising engineer in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office at the California Department of Water Resources. And he'll be speaking about groundwater and drought in California. Tyler is the manager of the modeling and tools support section and project manager for the development of the Fine Grid California Central Valley Groundwater Surface Water Simulation Model affectionately known as, if I get this right, C2VS, no, C2V Sim FG. So Tyler has over 12 years of experience in water resource engineering with a background in numerical modeling applications. Hi, my name is Tyler Hatch, and I'm a supervising engineer in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office at the California Department of Water Resources. In thinking about the uh, today's topic for the drought prediction and priorities focusing on groundwater, I will provide an overview of some groundwater efforts managed by the state of California, starting with an overview of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and then talking about several data sets and tools we have and how they might be able to support drought prediction and planning. As of 2015, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA, as we call it, provides the statutory requirements for groundwater management across the state of California. The central tenet of SIGMA is that groundwater management is best accomplished locally due to the size and diversity of conditions across the state. SIGMA defines local public agencies called groundwater sustainability agencies who are responsible for the development and implementation of a groundwater sustainability plan to achieve locally defined sustainable groundwater conditions. The state has oversight roles to provide regulatory review, technical and financial assistance, as well as enforcement when local agencies are unable to meet the minimum standards identified by SIGMA. 
the entire process is stakeholder driven and highly encourages public participation to help guide sustainable groundwater management. Sustainability is defined as the avoidance of locally defined undesirable results for six sustainability indicators, lowering of groundwater levels, reduction of storage, seawater intrusion, degraded water quality, land subsidence, and depletion of interconnected surface water. Sigma applied to all alluvial groundwater basins in the state as defined by California DWR Bulletin 118. However, the statutory deadlines for reaching sustainability only apply to a subset of groundwater basins prioritized as high or medium priority. Of the high and medium priority basins, those designated in Bulletin 118 to be in a condition of critical overdraft were required to submit groundwater sustainability plans by 2020 and become sustainable by 2040, whereas the rest of the high and medium priority basins were required to submit groundwater sustainability plans by 2022 and become sustainable by 2042. The Department of Water Resources maintains a database of periodic groundwater level measurements. These can be used to identify long-term trends in water levels, such as you can see here on the left from fall of 2012 to fall of 2017. And these trends can be used to identify things in the context of drought that might need to uh, have additional resources at the local level. On the right, we have the dry well database, which is a public interface where anybody can go and report dry wells. And this has been a really useful asset that started in the last uh, portion of the drought back in 2012 to 2014, where people are, were able to go and identify for the state so that we could deploy resources for uh, drought uh, response related to those dry wells. Some of the data challenges we have are related to groundwater pumping rates and locations, limited knowledge about fractured rock groundwater use outside of the state defined alluvial basins, and data gaps in other areas of the water budget that relate to groundwater, such as land use and stream flow. We have here a depiction of a, the spatial distribution of irrigation wells, as well as the number of installations per year since uh, about 1977. And you can see a notable uptick in the installations of those wells during drought periods. The department also maintains several groundwater surface water modeling tools, the California Central Valley Groundwater Surface Water Simulation Model that my team maintains, as well as the Sacramento Valley Surface Water Groundwater Simulation Model, SVSIM. And we also partner with the USGS California Water Science Center to work closely with their Central Valley model CVHM2 and help align and uh, compare the input data between those models to make it most useful for the public. Two areas where models can help us related to drought are in understanding stream depletion and where impacts might occur related to increased groundwater pumping and interconnected systems such as uh, how the depletion is distributed and how long the depletion will take to occur. And the other thing is land subsidence. And we can look at how drought might affect the critical infrastructure due to subsidence and how long land, inelastic land subsidence can continue as a result of the drought. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Tyler, that, for that review of the groundwater and drought tools you're using and have developed in California. And as before, if you have any questions for Tyler, please do post them in the chat. Definitely, Tyler's presentation gave us gave us a great background on that, you know, as far as groundwater and drought in California. So um, during the breakout sessions, we'll hear from you about your individual applications, but before we get to those sessions, we have one more mentee question for you related to time scales, most of interest uh, to you related to groundwater prediction. So I'm, I'm interested in this one as well. It was, it was neat to see, I don't know how many might have dialed in for the stream flow uh, focus listening session we had a couple of months ago, so I'm super interested in, in folks perspective on this minty question so again 
probably know the drill. You may be there already, and we can take a look at what these results are looking like, and then we'll get into the uh, moving over to the breakouts. So we might be able to flip to the results if you're if you see any coming in now, Eric. Monthly. It's always fun to see two of them flip like that. So the annual and the retrospective are pretty close. Oh, you know, we've got a little bit of a tie. They're they're duking it out for second place. This is a fun one. Monthly for groundwater. I mean, that that makes sense to me. As I've mentioned before, this was a uh, in a past life uh, some groundwater modeling where at least at that time we were pretty fortunate to shoot for annual, but that uh, that resolution is steadily increasing. And that need for retrospective is certainly a big one. Almost 50. Anyone else want to want to vote? Provide their thoughts on the most useful time scale for groundwater prediction. This is a pretty good idea, I think. So we can we can move on now. So yeah, yeah. Thanks again for adding that input. I'm going to turn it back to Marina to introduce our breakouts. Okay, so just a quick review for the rest of our agenda up till 3.30 p.m. ET. First, we're going to take a few minutes to introduce the breakout sessions to you, talk about how they're structured. Then we'll take a short five-minute break. And during that period, you will be automatically moved to one of the breakout sessions, which will last for about an hour. And following the breakout sessions, there will be a 15-minute break. We can all stand and take a, a little little bio break, and then we will reconvene as a large group to share a final report out on key discussion topics. And we'll end with a brief review of next steps. So the objective of today's breakout sessions is to get your feedback in a smaller group setting on your priorities and the need for monitoring and predicting groundwater changes related to drought conditions. And related to that, what kind of products would um, help you the most, product development or product improvements? As Brian mentioned, our primary goal for these listing sessions is to hear from you directly about your needs and priorities. And we thank you in advance for your participation and candid comments. We also again ask for your patience as we manage the logistics of moving everyone into a breakout and back to the broader group. So during the breakout sessions, your facilitator will walk you through four questions. The first question focuses on understanding your applications for groundwater information to anticipate changes related to drought. Next, we'll spend some time discussing the challenges, special considerations, and common uncertainties that uncertainties, excuse me, that you face for predicting groundwater changes related to drought. Whoops, gonna mute there. So next we're interested in learning what type of hydrologic drought information products or indices you currently use and what you like or dislike about those products. And this will lead into our final discussion of what improvements to groundwater information and prediction would help you the most for your application. And finally, to wrap up, your facilitator will ask you to identify the priorities or responses from other attendees that really resonated with you. And from there, your facilitator will look, work with the entire group to identify one overall key takeaway to share with the larger group when we reconvene in the plenary. As mentioned, after a short break, we will be starting the breakout sessions at 1.50 p.m. ET. We're going to be assigning you randomly to breakout groups, and we are hoping this will provide an opportunity for cross-sectoral sharing and enhance brainstorming. We would appreciate your feedback on this, as well as other aspects of this listing session afterwards. And in the session, you will be joined by a NIDIS or USGS facilitator and note taker. We'll be making sure to keep track of all of, your, all of the ideas you share. So when you join the breakout session, you should have access to use all the, the Teams meeting virtual features, including uh, viewing participants, using the chat, using reactions, 
full access to your video, ability to unmute and leave the meeting. So all of those kind of options. As a quick introduction to this functionality, you can uh, click on the icon of two people shown in the upper left of, of this slide to view participants. You can click in the chat bubble at the top of your screen to participate in the breakout session chat. Um, all the chat comments will be captured, so please don't hesitate to use this functionality to interact with others in the breakout. You can use the reactions at the top of your team's um, app or browser and use reactions. Click that face with the raised hand, and there's several different um, reactions you can choose from. Them. Just a few more tips. Please use the raise hand function if you would like to share something verbally to the group. And of course, remember to unmute when you are speaking. Always a reminder needed. We also like to encourage you to use your camera if you can during the breakout sessions. And finally, if you need to leave the breakout at any time, you can use the return button to return to the main room. If you've got any questions regarding the Microsoft Teams functionality, please do ask the facilitator. Okay, with that, we will now take a short break. And during that time, you should again be automatically moved to the breakout room. If you find there's any problem accessing that breakout session, please rejoin this main room using the link in your calendar invite if necessary, and let us know you need help via the chat and one of the hosts will make sure to get you into a breakout, fix your problem. So we'll see you again as a large group in about an hour for a discussion of key points that emerged during the breakout sessions. Thanks. Thanks everybody um, and thanks for your patience. Welcome back from the break and thanks for all of your uh, hard work that you put into those breakout sessions. They were really, really quite good. Um, just a quick overview of how we're gonna finish off this, uh, this session. Uh, here are three things we're going to try to accomplish. First, we're gonna go through an initial summary of the input that we received today in the breakout sessions. And then we're, we're gonna go back to the Mentimeter and we're gonna do a quick prioritization exercise where each group provided of different ideas. Some of them are a little similar, but they're all different enough that we kept them spread out. And we'd like all of the participants to then rank those of which ones you think would have, which improvements would have the biggest impact on you and your job. Um, and keep in mind, well, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then we'll discuss next steps and upcoming sessions. And I think I'm passing back to Brian for that. So first, what did we hear from all of you in the breakout sessions? Um, there were uh, there were 12 sessions of which number five was disbanded, so we ended up, ha up having only 11, um, but just for a placeholder, five is on there uh, too. I'm going to go through what we heard from each one, and then we'll go to, to the ranking exercise. Uh, so th I'll just read through these. I don't think, I can't think of any more efficient way to do it. So th this is what we heard from the group. Uh, improvements to groundwater information would include higher spatial resolution of groundwater data, improved monitoring covering frequent uh, in coverage and frequency of reporting, accessible long-term hydro information measured in close proximity. Um, number four, assessments on the correlations of groundwater data with other indices, spatially and temporally, and uh, how these and how how rely on these indices to understand ground, groundwater conditions. Is there a typo in there? Um, uh, if, if somebody has some clarity on that, that would yeah, be useful. Yeah. Um, Joel, sorry about that. How we can rely on these indices to understand groundwater conditions. Perfect. Thank you, Marina. So how we can rely on those. So I think that that typo has probably been moved over into the Mentimeter poll too. So when you come to that, keep that in mind that that's how that should be read. Uh, number six, weekly predictions on a one kilometer grid. Number seven, predictive groundwater models, but only with um, but only with understandable in outputs and certainties disclosed. Uh, so I think that's talking about how how clear is that output information. Number eight, better understanding of the interactions between groundwater and surface water and linkages to soil moisture and its monitoring. So that's a little different from the other groundwater surface water interactions that this one includes a soil moisture component. Number nine, guided one stop shop that integrates the different data available at different spatial and temporal scales. Number 10, surface water groundwater interactions in connected and disconnected systems, including seasonal aspects and evolution. Uh, number 11, centralized web app that reports higher resolution groundwater data. And number 12, a concept of analogy years for groundwater. So 
So what we're going to do now is go to the Mentimeter poll. The, the link is here. Put in this code. And um, I'm going to and uh, I'm going to give you just a few minutes to go in and begin ranking these different uh, suggested priorities in order of which one do you think would have the the biggest impact or would create the most value for you and your job. Uh, so I'm just going to stop talking. I'm going to give you just a few minutes to go and do that, and then I'll show you the results in a minute. Joel, can I add something, Marina here? Yes, please do, just Marina. Let folks know that we recognize, you know, this was a pretty quick process and we wanted to make sure we heard from each of the groups, but uh, several of these are overlapping and, and you know, maybe it's also not quite clear what, what the particular point was, was meaning, but uh, so just do the best you can. We just want to get a sense here. We're not, uh, this is not going to lock us into anything, but just wanting to get a sense of the group of which of these that you've heard um, flows to the top for you as well. Thanks for that clarity. I, I may add an, uh, something else, and that is that just because something gets ranked low doesn't mean that it's not important at all. And all of this information has been captured in the notes from the breakout sessions. This exercise is really just to help us contextualize what floated to the top among all of the different groups, but nothing's going to be lost from this ranking exercise. I may. Oh, Hey, Joel, while we wait, I don't know if you saw there is a couple of are you reading those now? I'm reading them now. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, sorry, I'm a little slow. No, no, those. No. Um, I think. Uh, I may talk about the uh, Kate's comment. It's difficult to prioritize because I see process and data needed analysis needed and communication needed. They're they're all needed, and I think that's a great point. Um, it, it's kind of hard to just pick one um, when there's so many rooms for improvement. And in fact, we're gonna, we're capturing all of the comments in the chat. And uh, Kate, that I think that point's going to be carried over into our analysis after this meeting. Um, and Catherine added a comment, um, adding input from our main room breakout session to share with the group. And so she writes, understanding the status of groundwater information for policy and planning decisions for land managers, for example, Forest Service and BLM. Um, so thanks. Um, Stacy said, is the poll posted? I'm Still seeing the latest poll on the timeline. Yes, it is. The poll's posted, but it's with a different code. So um, that that's probably a little bit of the confusion here. The code has just been the new code has just been pasted into the chat. Thank you, Alicia. All right, we've had uh, about 20 people already uh, make their ranking. I'm going to move the results up onto the main screen for you to see how things are being ranked now. And please keep keep working on this um, as we look at which uh, which groundwater Im information improvements have floated to the top. And that. Um, so improving our understanding between soil moisture and groundwater and surface water in drought. Uh, 
uh, has risen to the top. Uh, there were a few. Uh, there were a, a few of these suggested improvements that had to do with that surface water groundwater interaction. Um, and how those interact with each other. Um, and the soil moisture aspect of that, I think, is an interesting one. Uh, so that's that's come out number one so far. Uh, number two is higher spatial resolution of groundwater data is not a, a big surprise there either. Uh, we've got some things moving around. Uh, centralized web app just moved from eighth up to seventh. Uh, so Mary asked if I can show the results in a higher resolution. I I don't know. I can see if zooming in works. I don't think I can. Zooming in is making all of the other text bigger. So I apologize for that. I think that's one of the limitations of Mentimeter. I'm not seeing much more movement. Um, maybe I'll Maybe we'll we'll wrap it up there. So looking at uh, well, sorry, I, I don't mean to. If you're still working on this and reading and trying to prioritize, please do. Um, but I, I'm saying that like the things seem to have stopped. So I think most of the people who are, are voting probably have. Uh, so looking at the um, the items that raise the top, the top three are improving understanding between soil moisture and groundwater and surface water drought. Uh, higher spatial resolutions of groundwater data and improving monitoring frequency and co fre coverage slash frequency of reporting. Uh, those are the top three. Um, we've got just a few minutes. If any of you think that maybe you, you adamantly disagree with how this ranking has come out, we'd really be interested in hearing your perspective on this. Uh, so I would invite you to I think you need to put it into the chat. So type it in the chat of maybe something that you really disagree with with how these came out and why. Um, we'd really be interested in that. And and maybe if there's anything wrong here. Uh, just reading some of the comments in the chat box. <laughs> Excuse me. So this comment from Meredith is interesting. It's a little bit about um, the the type of data that's used, something that's uh, data that's really easy to to be transferred and shared. So uh, she said all, all data needs to be added to GIS later and automatically updated to improve the ability to visualize and assess along with all the other indices. One of the comments that came up um, in our group was that some of the older groundwater data that comes from like, uh, like um, well information, well height information, a lot of it is in, it's not digitized, it's not in a format that could be easily used or shared. Uh, that makes things challenging. So they pointed out that the fourth is similar to the first, and that's, I, I think that's right. There are a few small differences. The first one includes a, a soil moisture component. Um, the fourth one does not. If we were to combine those, I wonder how much more that would stand out. And says, oh, it would be nice to be able to rank them. Uh, we had our second ranked question represented regarding public education and outreach. So I, I agree with that. So um, Anne was the note taker in my group. And so um, we suggested that the higher resolution of groundwater data was probably the most important, but a close second to that was helping, uh, was public outreach and helping people understand uh, how how groundwater works and why is it important? Uh, what are it, and what are its limitations to some of its use? Um, I, that's thanks for bringing that up, and um, I think that we finished the ranking exercise. Uh, I, this isn't changing much anymore. Uh, thank you all for your participation and uh, for providing your insights.
I'm going to pass back to Brian and Marina to wrap up this listening session. Thanks, everyone. Yep, thanks, Joel. Thanks, everybody, for, for sticking around and providing your input on that in the ranking. I hope that's, uh, you know, kind of a nice nice way to, to see at least how this, this cohort is looking at, you know, what's important to groundwater prediction in relation to drought. So I can go through the next steps. Marina, did you have any, any comments on uh, on today's session? Well, just want to reiterate what Joel mentioned, which is that we are carrying all of this forward. And uh, we did we would also like to get your feedback on whether that ranking exercise uh, was useful or or just was a little bit too confusing since there was the overlap. But you know there were there was more than one theme coming out of that, and we'll just make a point, as we said, of carrying that forward. Yep. Definitely. And so I mentioned next steps and and as Joel and Marina have all talked about, you know, we'll be pulling in all this information. This final ranking was was just uh, again hopefully kind of a, a fun fun efficient way to look at at thoughts and and how each group was was discussing uh, these outputs. But we also want to use this session to learn from it, make improvements in the next session. I know we always we have maybe a little different hiccup with teams each time. You know, there's always new updates to teams. Uh, just when we think we've got it down, there's there's something uh, a new functionality that's that's thrown at us. Sometimes good, and sometimes it provides opportunity to improve. Right. So we'll continue to learn from that, and hopefully learn how to best manage the breakouts and and the discussions. I wanted to point out the upcoming sessions. If you haven't registered for those already, we hope you can and, and plan to attend. Those are coming up July 14th. We'll have one on water use. Um, then we'll have take a month off and come back in September and have one on water availability prediction for ecosystems. So those will be our two next listening sessions we have planned for this series. Uh, and then, as we've talked about, we're going to take all this information and provide and, and look at synthesizing kind of all the salient points and bring that out into our national listening session series. And that's going to be, um, I think we've discussed that as more of a webinar base. So we'll be reporting out on what kind of what we've what we've gained from um, these sessions throughout the year and wrap that up near the end of October. Um, aside from that, again, just really appreciate everyone showing up today, um, providing that input. Had some great discussions in my group, I know, and certainly appreciate the whole team. Marina, thank you for the awesome co-moderator there, Joel, for wrapping us up. Of course, there's um, folks behind the scenes. Catherine Dom, thank you so much. Eric Smith, um, there's just a, a whole group of, of people and all our facilitators and note takers. So. Um, really appreciate everybody's time. Look forward to the next one. Hope you can join us in July. Marina? Yep. Thank you all very much for your time and, and your contributions. Really appreciate it. Okay. See you soon. Bye.